Natasha Stone. Yeah, she's got all the
and you're all welcome to come to that as well. Um, and finally, I just want to invite everyone on um, December 3rd at 4 o'clock. The Institute is going to have its uh, end of the semester sherry hour, and it's just a social event, so come by, say hello, meet the fellows, and have a you don't have to drink sherry if you're talking about other things, but you, you, can, have, you can have a glass of wine. Um, so with that, I would like to ask um, our colleague Sarah Hall from the Department of Germanic Studies and the Honors College to introduce today's speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very um, pleased and honored um, to be introducing um, Salome Aguilera-Sumerski today um, for today's fellow's talk. Um, thank you for um, inviting me to do so. Um, Salome aguilera Skowski came to UIC as Assistant Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies in 2012. After a year as a Provost Career Enhancement postdoctoral scholar at the University of Chicago and then teaching at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She received her PhD in English on the Film Studies track in 2009 from the University of Pittsburgh. Her dissertation entitled The Ethnic Turn, Studies in Political Cinema from Brazil and the United States, 1960 to 2002, received the Eduardo Lozanzo Memorial Dissertation Prize, <coughs> excuse me, Memorial Dissertation Prize from the University of Pittsburgh's Center for Latin American Studies. In this dissertation, Skversky expanded the discussion about political cinema to include not only films that perform a Marxist class critique, but also those that are part of what she identifies as an ethnic turn in both Brazilian and U.S. films. She focuses her historically grounded close analyses on films that confront racial oppression across the history of African slavery, indigenous genocide, and European immigration, charting changes in cinematic representation as both a response to and a voice in debates over social inequity in two different um, but related cultural contexts that are both impacted by global capitalism. Um, as a graduate student, Skaversky's essay on race and melodrama entitled The Price of Heaven, Remaking Politics in All That Heaven Allows, Ali Fear Eats the Soul and Far From Heaven, won the Society for Cinema and Media Studies Graduate Student Essay Prize in 2007 and was subsequently published in Cinema Journal. Her Cinema Novo case study essay, Quilombo and Utopia, the Aesthetic of Labor in Linduarte Norana's Aruanda appeared in the Journal of Latin American Cultural Studies in 2011. Here, Skrowski examines the uh, 1960 film um, Aruanda as a classic documentary that takes an anti-culturalist approach to the milieu of the Quilombo, or the Maroon Settlement, by seeking the utopian element in the unalienated life activity of its residents. Skrowski demonstrates how and why this analytical and aesthetic approach was soon supplanted by representations of the Quilombo as the location of an African or Afro-Brazilian cultural life in particular. Other noteworthy pu uh, publications include an analysis of the cinematic representation of racial politics in The Forgotten Utopia of Brazilian Film, Palmares, the State, and the Black Movement, published in the Graduate Student Review in 2007, and her study of the representation of Hindu fundamentalism in the 1991 documentary Ram Kingdom in the Cinema of India, edited by Lalita Gopalan and published by Wallflower, Wallflower Press in 2009. Most recently, she's published um, work that she shared with us when she first came to UIC, the post-colonial city symphony film, and the ruins of Sweet Havana, which came out in Social Identities Journal for the Study of Race, Nation, and Culture in 2013. And here you see echoes of the um, her uh, work on um, the remake of um, Far From Heaven, All That Heaven Allows, and Ali Furies the Soul, in um, a cross-cultural examination that centers on genre and the representation of work. Um, her own academic labor is quite substantial. She has produced a documentary on Cuban baseball for PBS, has organized an international conference on co um, comparative post-colonialities, and last year drew together an incredibly impressive international panel for the Chicago <coughs> Film Seminar comprised of scholars of Latin American cinema engaged in theorizing the politics of cinema. Here at UIC, she's taught courses on Latin American cinema that encourage students to interrogate the categories of national cinemas and explore how visual media create and deconstruct racial and ethnic categories in urban, regional, colonial, and post-colonial contexts across the 20th and 21st centuries. 
Her book project, The Aesthetic of Labor, Work, Toil, and Utopia in Latin American Political Cinema, locates Latin American documentary cinema within a history of cinema's fascination with work and work processes over its entire um, media life. It focuses most particularly on the aesthetics and politics of the process genre, which are um, a genre of films about production processes um, in Latin America and world film history. And she provides a critical view into the self-reflexive moments in which documentaries take an ethnographic interest in artisanal production, the organization of labor, and the stories that develop when individuals engage in work for one another or alongside one another. Her talk today relates to that. Um, it is about the force of, ide of ideology legible in the representation of emotion in narratives about domestic service in recent Latin American cinema. It's entitled Home Work, uh, Cinema's <coughs> Laborious Feeling. So please join me in welcoming Salome Averroskorsky to the podium. Far a great year. I'm very grateful for the opportunity, really. Okay. Um, so, this is really a case study from the um, book project that Sarah um, talked about. Uh, and you'll get a better sense, probably, of how it fits in, even just from the title of the book project as I um, go along. Okay. So, um, Anyone who spent time in Latin America um, is familiar with paid domestic service. Maids, nannies, servants, cooks, gardeners, drivers are fixtures in the everyday lives of a substantial swath of the population, including in middle and even working class households. Moreover, according to the International Labor Organization, over 26% of working women are employed in domestic service. This is not similarly the case in the global north, which is to say that domestic service is a special thing um, in Latin America. I want to, want to give you first a sense of that um, global comparative context. Okay, so domestics have long appeared in Latin American popular film and television, but in the last 15 years, we've seen a cycle of Latin American art films about paid domestic service as an institution. This is new, um, and I want to give you a sense of my working archive. So the archive spans between about 1998 and 2014. It includes documentaries and fiction films by known auteurs or would-be auteurs, and it includes many of the most critically acclaimed, award-winning Latin American films of the period. So you see La Cienaga, um, Camadentro, Santiago, Parque Villa, um, La Nana, all of these have won awards. Um, and you probably recognize others like La Teta Asustada and El Niño Pez. So what are these films like? The subject of these films, as I said, is the institution of paid domestic service. The films are unlike a previous generation of Latin American popular culture featuring maids. Unlike the film and media of the past, the domestic workers of this recent cycle are, for the most part, not involved in interclass romances. The films are not allegorical narratives, foundational fictions, stitching the nation together through the mechanism of marriage plots between brown maids and their white employers. Nor are the films of popular melodramas featuring saintly domestics whose virtue goes unrecognized by malevolent mistresses. Instead, these films, the films in my archive, eschew moralistic frameworks. They often feature liberal, kind-hearted, well-intentioned masters. The interest of these films is not in the treatment, is not in their treatment of the politics of exploitation, but rather in what has been called the affects of domination. Um, whether because they recognize this cycle of films is unlike a previous Latin American, Latin American cinema <coughs> domestic service, or because they don't know what else to compare them to. International critics have tended to compare these films to their European art film counterparts from a previous generation. So reviews are replete with references to Louise Buñuel, Joseph Losey, Claude Chabrol. The Village Voice reviewer, uh, Scott Foundas, for example, writes about La Nana. 
quote, this is him, the remains of the day as reimagined by a budding Luis Buñuel. But this rings false to me, actually. Um, compared to their European counterparts, the films in my archive are comparatively wholesome. The paradigmatic European art films about domestic service, <coughs> say Joseph Losey's The Servant, or Luis Buñuel's Diary of a Chambermaid, or Claude Chabrol's La Ceremonie, are absorbed by the sadism of the master-servant relationship. There's no glimmer of purity or reciprocity or genuine intimacy between master and servant. There's only putrefaction, deception, mutual destruction. The servants, while they may be depraved, twisted by servitude, they have class consciousness. They understand very well the realities of the master-servant power dynamic. There is little in this in the recent cycle of Latin American, in the Latin American cycle. On the contrary, the films in my archive are interested in a rarely noted paradox of domestic service. That such an exploitative form of work can produce such a fierce identification of the master, of the servant, with the employer. That such an exploitative form of work can coexist with a low level of class consciousness. In other words, the fascination of these films is with the question of the domestic's genuine affective attachment and the existence of a mutually felt intimacy between master and servant, despite everything. What accounts for this recent interest in paid domestic service among Latin America's most accomplished auteurs? <coughs> Part of the explanation is that in the last few decades, domestic service in Latin America has changed. It hasn't become less common. People are still hiring others to cook, clean, cook, nanny, show for a garden, etc. But the character of paid domestic service is changing. The traditional master-servant relationship has long been understood as a pre-modern relationship a species of colonial patron-client relationship. This pre-modern character has been said to follow from three distinctive features of the occupation. First, traditionally, the servant lived in. Her home was the master's home. Her privacy and thereby her freedom were delimited by the arrangement. Second, the number of hours she worked was often unspecified. She was, in some sense, always on duty. Third. The tasks of most servants were nonspecific. They included a variety of jobs, from cleaning to cooking to taking care of children. The servant would spend a lifetime working for one family, and often her children would become servants to the next generation. The family that employs servants has been described as a greedy organization. One not satisfied with, this is a quote um, by an important sociologist, with claiming a segment of time, commitment, and energy of the servant, as is the case with other occupational arrangements in the modern world, but demanding full allegiance. The master and his family always attempt greedily to absorb the personality of the servant." End quote. The symptom of this absorption is this, the servant's identification with the master. Given the extent of isolation and surveillance, which are structural features of living in, as I said, it's been observed that servants manifest, and this is another commentator talking, a high degree of identification and affective involvement with the master and his household. The servant basks in the glories of reflected status and borrowed identity. Okay, that's the traditional model. Social scientists agree that servitude in Latin America is being contractualized as it gets absorbed by capitalist labor relations, and as the state has been pressured to formalize employment in the sector. In practice, this means that maids are increasingly living out. Employment agencies are entering the picture to mediate between private households and potential employees. As a consequence, the occupation is becoming more short-term and intermittent. Servants work for several families rather than exclusively for one. They change jobs. Um, sorry. They change jobs more frequently. Tasks are more sharply defined as a stricter division of labor takes hold. So, with contractualization comes a transformation of the character of the relationship between domestics and their employers. Before, the paternalistic features of servanthood, which included intimacy and identification, supported the buttressing ideological fiction that the maid was, and this is the parlance that you're probably familiar with, a member of the family, or like a daughter. Increasingly, that ideological fiction is becoming untenable, as domestic workers are becoming more like regular employees. 
What I want to suggest is that in my cycle of films, that my cycle of films is reflecting on this change. Servitude is no longer what it used to be. In the face of this historical rupture, the films register a certain, to be sure, politically incorrect ambivalence. On the one hand, they're conscious of the politically problematic character of traditional domestic service. On the other hand, they're nostalgic for the cross-class intimacy between masters and servants that traditional domestic servant service made possible. Okay, so as a way of orienting you, um, let me give you an example of this nostalgia. Perhaps the most nostalgic of the films in my archive is Santiago, the 2007 Brazilian documentary by Joao Moreira Salles, ostensibly about a family's major domo, Santiago, the title of the film, who spent 30 years with the filmmaker's family, which is now provided for his retirement. Okay, so this is the opening of the film. <coughs> it's just to give you a taste. Thirteen years ago, when I shot these images, I thought the film would begin like this. First, a sorrowful tune. Not exactly this one, which I didn't hear until much later, but something like it. Then, a slow glide towards three photographs. The first photograph shows the entrance to a very large house, the house where I grew up. The second, a bedroom, my bedroom, that I shared with my brother Pedro. The third photograph shows a solitary chair on the veranda. When it was taken, the house was already empty. The last person to live there, my mother, had left five years before. For years, the house remained abandoned, and that's how I filmed it. I lived in this house from birth until I was 20. Myself, my brothers, my father, and my mother. Besides us, there were the servants, which were many. There were often business dinners, and less frequently, grand balls and gala parties. In one of my childhood memories, my brothers and I are dressed as waiters, holding trays amidst the guests, making believe we're serving. On such occasions, the man who handed me the tray and taught me how to balance it without spilling was Santiago the family butler. The film I tried to make 13 years ago was about him. Okay, so this plaintive opening might seem consistent with the reading of the film as an elegy for Santiago, the family butler, who emerges in the film as a real character. But the fascination of Santiago as a character has everything to do with his anachronism. He's a servant from another time. Santiago says at one point, I live in the Middle Ages. It all enchants me. He loves opera. He only plays Beethoven in coattails. Um, here are a few uh, frame enlargements. Santiago pridefully reports that the Salas family employed 22 servants. He has typewritten on a Remington 30,000 pages in five languages on the history of all the aristocracies of the world. When finished, he wrapped each lineage of story with a red ribbon um, purchased directly from Paris. He leaves the master-servant relationship as he imagined it existed in feudal Europe. Santiago and the world he evokes and that Salas brings to life, in effect releasing it from its antique frame, is a distant, perhaps mythical, feudal life, feudal past. The film is like a time machine. It takes us back to a, not to a dystopian moment, but to a past full of life, vigor, charm. All of the charm of this eccentric 80-year-old servant who has expended his life in servitude belongs to the anachronistic universe he and the filmmaker conspire to conjure for the spectator's voyeuristic pleasure. As I said before, nostalgia is one side of the ambivalence of this cycle. The other side is a recognition of the special terribleness of domestic service. I'll say more about the political pitfalls of nostalgia in a moment, but first let me say something about the peculiar badness of traditional domestic service. 
Domestic service is a kind of effective labor. That is, it's a kind of, I'm quoting um, Hart, uh, Michael Hart, labor that produces or manipulates affects such as, such as a feeling of ease, well-being, satisfaction, excitement, or passion. We might think of it we might think of affective labor as existing on a continuum of worrisomeness. On one end is the service, work of flight attendants and fast food worker, workers, i.e. those whose job it is to deliver service with a smile. At the, under, at the other end of the continuum is prostitution, commercial surrogacy, organ sale. Domestic service belongs to this end of the continuum. This latter subcategory of affective labor, sex work, commercial surrogacy, organ sale, and care work, has been the subject of intense debates within political and legal theory. Their debates have largely focused on the permissible limits of commodification. The key question has been how to think about what spheres of life, if any, should be commodified. The premise has been that there's an important distinction to be made between rent and labor power and selling the self, even if people disagree about where to draw that line. The favorite test for thinking about the special category of labor, where one is at risk of commodifying the self, um, i.e. alienating what is considered inalienable, is sex work, right? Adjudicating whether one is renting the body, selling a service, or selling the self requires a firm idea of what belongs to the person, what belongs to the substance of her being, to her personality, and what does not. In the case of sex work, those like Elizabeth Anderson, um, a political theorist, who defend the intrinsic degradation of sex work, um, argue that sexual acts should be understood on the model of gift exchange. Moreover, because sexuality on this view is seen as an integral part of the self, selling sexuality is considered a self-estranging activity that devalues the seller who allows her person to be used instrumentally as it devalues sexuality as a shared human good. As in sex work, the primary worry about domestic service is a worry about the nature of the commodity being bought and sold. It's generally thought that what is bought and sold in traditional paid domestic service is not labor power as we conventionally understand it. Um, that is the capacity to work at a defined task or a contractually agreed upon period of time. That is, the domestic worker is not merely renting out his body in an analogous way to the auto factory worker who spends the work day on the assembly line repeating a bodily action. Most would not say of the assembly line worker that she sells personhood. Yet most scholars maintain that it is personhood, or as one put it, her identity as a person that is being bought and that is being purchased in domestic service. This sale of personhood is at the core of the special badness of domestic service. If in sex work it is the sale of sexuality that's considered a sale of personhood, what is the corresponding gift? in domestic service. The work of the domestic servant requires the constant display of loyalty, care, affection. These displays are part of the job description. Given this, the domestic is faced with two options. She can either fake the emotion that she has to display, or two, she can make those emotions her own. If you fake it, as many people in the service industry do, you curse your master in your heart and police your outer expression so the curse does not shine through. Arlie Hochschild, writing on the emotional labor of flight attendants, has called this emotive dissonance. In other words, the tension between feigned emotion, a happy, loyal attitude toward the master, say, and sincere feeling within oneself. But emotive dissonance is exhausting, Hochschild maintains, it puts a strain on the individual that she will try to neutralize. The individual neutralizes the strain by bringing outside and inside closer together, either by not feigning or by changing what one feels. This is the second option, right, where the true feeling has been colonized and the individual is self-estranged. In effect, to the extent that the emotional labor demanded of the domestic ends up shaping not merely her face, i.e., her feigned outward behavior, but her inner feelings as well. To that extent, the commodity being purchased in domestic service is the personhood of the domestic, the substance of her being, her love. Okay, so if the European art films about domestic service explore the domain of emotive dissonance, performance, disguise, in other words, the geography of insincerity, 
The films in my archive are taken by identification and the significance of the authenticity of colonized feeling. As I said before, I said before that the films in this cycle are ambivalent. On the one hand, they're concerned with the sale of, per of the personhood of the domestic. On the other, they're nostalgic. It may be difficult to see how nostalgia for traditional domestic service could be anything other than the elites chafing at the loss of erstwhile seniorial privilege. In which case, we would have reason to think that the European art films on the subject of domestic service are better, or at least politically more palatable. Perhaps they are. But the point I want to emphasize is that the films of this Latin American archive are exploring an uncomfortable, largely unexamined dimension of domestic service. The significance of reciprocal cross-class intimacy. And I want to um, suggest the contours of a more charitable reading um, of the nostalgia of the cycle. So from the point of view of several of the films of my corpus, the authenticity of colonized feeling has a recuperable, dare I say, almost utopian dimension. Remember in the analogous case of sex work, the concern about sex work was twofold. On the one hand, it was a concern about the impact of the seller, the impact on the seller of selling personhood. But on the other, it was a concern about what happens to the gift value, in the case of sex work that was sexuality, when it's commodified. The second concern was about how commodification transforms the meaning and the value of the gift for everyone. Okay, now let's consider the case of domestic service. There's no question that the colonization of feeling amounts to the loss of the domestic's personhood. Yet, colonized feeling is no less authentic for being colonized. As the legal philosopher Margaret Radin said, this is her, commercial friendship is a contradiction, as is commercial love. The authentic colonized feeling of the domestic, in contrast to faking it, preserves the gift value of friendship and love as non-commodifiable shared human goods. We might say that colonized feeling, unlike soul sexuality and unlike mere feeling displays, has an impact on the seller, but preserves the gift values of love and care. <coughs> okay. So amidst the backdrop of the admittedly asymmetrical power relationship between domestics and employers, the servant's affection, emotion, care, exists as something of a miracle, an index of what's right and wrong in our world, or so the films would have it. The authenticity of her human feeling, her refusal of commercial love, is the glimmer of hope here. We might be tempted to say that the films are nostalgic for the truth in the tenderness of the servant's colonized feeling, the way that tenderness is linked to a refusal of commercial love. This should make clear that on both sides of the ambivalence in this cycle, the important question is about the domestic's emotion. That's the ultimate object of scrutiny. Let me say more, let me say, um, let me try to say more specifically about how this focus manifests in the films themselves. I think I neglected to say earlier um, that this is, I'm providing you with a framework for thinking about this cycle. Um, I have a whole other part that I can't present today that does a sort of more close analysis of the film. So I'm just trying to give you the sort of big picture argument. So it shouldn't escape our notice that for several of the films of this cycle, documentaries like Santiago, Paulina, Empleadas y Patrones, Domestica, and fiction films like Parque Villa, Criada, Batalla en el Cielo, the servant role is played by the director's actual servant or family servant. Even when the servant is not played by the filmmaker's actual servant, the character is based on a real figure from the director's biographical life. These films have their basis in personal experience. The directors are mostly in their 30s and 40s. They were growing up with live-in maids in the 80s and 90s in the wake of the collapse of revolutionary projects across the region. The child had a relationship with her servant. As an autonomous adult, one of his first acts is to eulogize her. The domestics in these films are treated with care and consideration. The representations are, to use the language of stereotype analysis, positive. These filmmakers love their domestics. That's not the issue. But what about the domestics' love? Like a detective story, the films in this cycle sleuth out signs of love. Incredulous and insecure, they seem to ask, does she love me truly? In other words, was her feeling colonized? Was it authentic? Or was she pretending? Was it insincere? 
For example, in the film El Niño, El Niño Pez, which I'm going to show you a clip uh, of, the momentum of the film is shaped by the indecipherability of the domestic's affection. Eileen, who's the domestic, is the obscure object of everyone's desire. She's a cipher. Almost every character in the film wants her. Her own father, the judge for whom she works, the man she seems to live with, a prison official, a prison guard, and the film's main character, Lala, who's the employer's daughter. But Eileen herself is inscrutable. In fact, the film is organized around the mystery of her desire. Whose desire does she actually reciprocate? Only at the very end does it seem that it's her charge, i.e. Lala, the employer's daughter, that she truly loves. And even this remains ambiguous. So this is the final, um, the final uh, shot of the film. This is Lala on the left, and the and Eileen, the domestic, on the right.
in order for her to love me truly, in order to wrest a hopeful kernel from the sea of terrible that is domestic service, the domestic must be a person, free, free to dispense with her love as she pleases. In other words, if the film were to claim the tenderness, the true love of colonized feeling, of a feeling born out of the affects of domination, the personhood of the servant figure must be restored. But how to do that representationally is not a straightforward matter. Okay, so I've tried to characterize the distinctiveness of this psychosocial terrain of the cycle of Latin American art films about domestic service. But in what follows, I'd like to briefly discuss the representational questions raised by my framework. How do the films negotiate cinematically the tension that I've been describing? If personhood is what's compromised in domestic service, indicating the domestic's personhood, her inner life, herself, cinematically is complicated business. How do you suggest its existence? How do you penetrate its mystery? In the films, the films in the cycle adopt various representational strategies in their pursuit of a restored pers sort of personhood. I'll briefly sketch the three most prominent. So first, in the films, in films like La Nana, Camarentro, and Play, personhood is wrapped up with the maid's identities as consumer citizens, making lifestyle choices through their spending habits. So this is a frame enlargement from the last shot of La Nana. Raquel, um, she's the maid in La Nana, gains a modicum of autonomy and privacy when she dons a Walkman, which presents her with the possibility of fashioning her identity through the exercise of musical taste. We have here personhood bequeathed by the inherent equality of commodity exchange. All customers are created equal. This is the last shot of the film. Okay. Okay, so the second approach um, is probably the most obvious one. It's the, um, the idea is that it return, restores uh, servant personhood by giving voice to the servant, so by listening for subaltern speech. In this approach, the interview is king. This is how Salas, the um, filmmaker who made Santiago, that's how his project began, with a five-day interview of Santiago. In his approach, in this approach, the servant narrates his or her life, the stories of his or her childhood, the story of his or her family, recounts his or her leisure pursuits. Indeed, several of the films in my archive do this. Besides Santiago and Paulina and Empleadas and Patrones, um, which feature a series of interviews with maids about their working conditions, there's also Fernando Mirelli's um, Domesticas, which weaves together the aspirational stories of several maids living their own lives and pursuing their own occupational dreams quite apart from their work lives. Um, Paulina, also a film, this is the first film in the archive, um, named after the filmmaker's childhood domestic exploits to create effect the, pop, the potential of the interview. Funari, who's the filmmaker, um, in the film, she weaves Paulina's own narration, which isn't merely articulate, but sensitive and reflective with reenactments. And thereby, she manages to gesture at Paulina's interior life, perhaps the most persuasive sign of personhood. Funari's film incorporates tangential details of Paulina's narration and makes use of a subjective camera to mimic a kind of perceptual subjectivity. Crucially, the perception being mimicked does not always pertain to the main actions being recounted. So Paulina is mostly talking about her childhood. She was raped, she was forced to marry a cacique from her village, um, her husband beat her, and then she escapes to Mexico City. Um, in fact, the camp, um, this perceptual subjectivity often per pertains to her non-instrumental encounter with the natural world. In this opening sequence of the film, which I'm going to show you, Paulina describes her daily work as a domestic. So just to give you more of an idea. This is the opening of the film.
después le va a ayudar a limpiar los coches para la calle y luego me pongo a hacer el aseo en la sala, el comedor, en las recámaras. Después de terminar todo el aseo de la casa, me voy a super a comprar los alimentos. Entonces me pongo a cocinar y me trato de meterme ¿no? en la cocina. Y me gusta mucho la cocina. Eh, y a veces me concentro tanto en la cocina que aunque esté la señora hablándome, a veces no, 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 no le respondo. ¿no? Creo que son mis cómplices, mis, mis verduras, mis cosas. Les digo que están ricas, están ricas, hablo con ellas. Yo trato con mucho cariño para que se esté sabrosa la comida. Y siempre hablo con las cosas. Le digo buenas noches a mi lavadora de trastes porque ella lava los trastes en lugar mío. Entonces yo lavo mucho. Por ejemplo, la lavadora de, de ropa, la secadora, me salgo a las puertas porque qué tal si quieren respirar o algo más. Y me ayuda mucho la secadora y la lavadora. Y las cuido mucho y las quiero mucho. So these shots, which feature mostly disembodied, bu busy hands, there's only one shot of Paulina's face, are juxtaposed with, the re with a reenactment featuring point of view shots of a child's hand caressing various plants and leaves, right? That's what you saw. Domestic labor is here visually analogized to the child's disinterested world, one world wonder. Paulina's voiceover anthropomorphizes peppers and dishwashers. The sequence establishes Paulina's sensitivity her spiritual distance from the menial, the dirty, the base, her distance, in other words, from the usefulness of household labor, which takes on a kind of seraphic quality. In effect, Paulina's personhood will be restored through the negation of household labor. We'll not see her laboring again in the film. So these examples, these two from Paulina, I mean, from, um, from uh, of the two approaches, the ones that privilege um, voice and the ones that privilege consumer citizenship, these examples establish the personhood of the domestic by insisting that personhood thrives in the interstices of work, work activity, in the realm of leisure life. The camera's task then is merely to train its lens, to train its lens, on these interstices to, de to detect what was always there. The idea is this, domestic service is bad in the way other jobs are not. Given this, one might think that the way to recuperate the domestic's personhood is to ignore her work and any deep link between her work and her person. Her person remains free, exempt from the badness of her work. But of course, this kind of approach begs the most difficult questions. Remember, the worry about domestic service is that it's a kind of work that irreversibly compromises the self on the job. And that compromised self is not, not restored when one clocks out. So this takes us to the third approach to pay domestic service, which, work, which focuses on the work of domestic labor itself. The investigation, who is she, um, is one that turns toward rather than away from what she does. Um, this is, in some sense, the antithesis of the second approach, as it eschews talk and self-narrativization. So, among the films about domestic service, there are two, Parque Villa and Criada, which concentrate on the work itself. In other words, on the actions performed at work. And we can talk afterwards about what's special about this category of films that focus on the work itself. But for now, let me tell you about what I think is the most interesting film in the cycle. So um, I'll say a few words about Parque Villa, which, as I said, is the most interesting and puzzling handling of domestic service in the cycle. It gets some of its interest from the fact that it's a kind of remake of the 1975 feminist um, classic, Jean Dielman, by the Belgian filmmaker Chantal Ackerman, about the household and sexual labor of a widowed housewife who works as a prostitute. The intertextual dialogue Parque Villa establishes with Jean Dielman reveals surprising dimensions of the problem of domestic service. So Parque Villa won the 2008 Locarno Film Festival. It's a fiction film about Beto, the caretaker of a vacant Mexico City villa that's up for sale. Frame enlargement. Um, the family vacated the house 10 years earlier, and Beto, their longtime domestic, 
um, and left their longtime domestic beto to maintain it until it sells. The beto character is based on the real life of Norberto Correa, the actor who plays the role. <coughs> beto, outside the house. Correa has had long worked as a domestic for the filmmaker's extended family. So this is actually Rivero's family's servant. Um, the film follows Beto through his daily activities in the last weeks of his employ. So these are just, I mean, it's mostly made up of his daily activities. So um, ironing, cleaning, cooking, lawn mowing. Um, in the 80 minutes that follow, we see Beto waking, washing, ironing, eating, cleaning, lawn mowing, watching television. We see him receiving periodic visits from the owner of the house, from the real estate broker showing the house to prospective buyers, and from the prostitute Lupe. We see him making two rare excursions into the chaotic world outside the villa. And I just want to show you um, a, a clip to give you a better idea. We get a series of this kind of shots. Genre. She writes, 
that Ackerman, and I'm quoting her just to give you a better sense of this account, um, she writes that Ackerman portrayed the dreaded routine. A fictional housewife is filmed by a frontal camera that remains fixed, suggesting that no action worth following is taking place. What film critics call Tom Moore dead time is the stuff of cinema for Ackerman. Viewers are forced to live the ensuing slowness, repetitiveness, and boredom as a function of spectatorship. Hard at work on the tasks of spectatorship, they learn in their own skin how it feels to move from the kitchen to the bedroom and back to the kitchen and then back to the bedroom, each time turning the light on and off, seemingly a million times. So I want you to judge that for yourself. So I'm going to show, this is um, a longish sequence, but I have to give you the sense of um, what um, Parvalescu and, and Kinder find to be um, boring, meaningless social rituals.
Um, what Parvalescu and other critics were missing is central to this film. Pre precisely unlike dead time. Unlike the dead time paradigmatically represented in the Little Maid sequence from Umberto D. The sequences of household labor and Jean Deal Dealman have a peculiar have a peculiar structure and impact. Had domestic labor ever looked so skilled and systematic? Had it ever seemed so necessary to the smooth functioning, to the maintenance of life? Had home economics wis wisdom ever resonated so viscerally? Today's unsmooth bedspread is tomorrow's unmade bed. Today's unwashed dish is tomorrow's dirty sink. This treatment of action, once we get the hang of it, establishes its own brand of expectations, suspends resolution. The effect is not the Brechtian distantiation one might expect from my description and often associated with dead time. The film produces a kind of spectatorial involvement that's undeniably sensorial, mesmeric. Actions, washing dishes, peeling potatoes, bathing, bed making, that in another kind of film would have been peripheral, elusive, become singularly fascinating. Jean Dealman valorizes the wife-mother figure that works in the home by valorizing her work. And it valorizes her work in two ways. For its reproductive contribution to the maintenance of life, which is established by tracking the routine over three days and suggesting the consequences of a breakdown, i.e. suds on a dish, unwashed dishes. And second, it valorizes it for its efficiency, its economy of movement. So I'm interested in three in three features of this dialogue between Jean Dielman and Pargevia. First, just as Jean Dielman rejects psychological and testimonial approaches to personhood, so too does Pargevia dispense with these prevalent approaches. <coughs> Jean Dielman insists on the link between identity and activity. She is what she does, and Pargevia does as well. My second interest is Pargevia's homage to Jean Dielman is largely formal. Rivero, like Ackerman, adopts a rigorous approach to shot framing, composition, camera movement. Jean Dielman uses the resources of cinema to impact the spectator sensorially. In Jean Dielman, our relationship to household labor is transformed. Household labor becomes sing singularly absorbing. This experience of seeing domestic tasks like we've never seen them before affects our experience of the one who performs them. Jean Dielman's investigation of domestic labor is as labor is singular in the history of film. If one wanted to think about the content of domestic labor, there's no more insistent touchstone than Jean Dielman. And yet there's something different in Parque Villa. The work of the domestic is not similarly transformed. That's a story for another time. Now, the third, um, the third reason to be interested in this dialogue is that one might think that Jean's sex work sets the film apart from Parque Villa in a crucial way. But actually, I think it brings the films closer together. And this is the final point. Um, what, after all, do we make of Rivero's decision to recast the housewife prostitute as a domestic servant? The domestic combines, in a sense, the housewife and the prostitute. She, re she performs household labor and provides care and comfort. As I said before, sex work and domestic service have long been compared. Both sex work and domestic service raise similar questions about the nature of the commodity. Is the worker selling herself or a service? We might read Parque Villa as reprising the standard comparison between sex work and domestic service, and thereby training our focus on the question at the heart of domestic service and prostitution. That is, the question of personhood and the commodification of the self. But there's more. In the debate on the character of prostitution, the pleasure of the sex worker has been a particularly vexing problem. Is it the sort of pleasure a hairdresser might experience giving a haircut? A view one could have if you think the commodity being sold is a service. Or is, it, or is, or is exploitation, self-estrangement being experienced as pleasurable? A view you could have if you think the self is being bought and sold. Or can pleasure and exploitation coexist? How is this relevant to the films under discussion? I've long been puzzled by Jean Dielman's orgasm in the film. On the one hand, the film implies that it's so unsettling that Jean slashes the, it implies that it's so unsettling that Jean slashes the client's throat in direct response. One might think the film suggests that her pleasure is so unsettling because it's masochistic, i.e., Jean is taking pleasure in her own degradation. 
if you're committed to the view that sex work is self-estranging, this must be your reading. After all, professionalism in sex work requires boundary maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. But notice that there's something analogous about the way Jean Dealman handles both sex work and homework. While it might seem that both index Jean's oppression, the way the film handles visually, cinematically, household labor, and the way it narratively handles sex work suggests something less straightforward. As I suggested before, homework has rarely looked so good, so compelling, so useful, can I say it, so pleasurable. Meanwhile, sex work, the film has suggested, has been accompanied by pleasure, the narrative of the film suggests. In both the homework and the sex work, we have this tense mixture of pleasure and unpleasure, monotony and exploitation, not in the technical sense. And if we don't read the pleasure as masochistic, we have an uncomfortable coexistence, simultaneity of skilled and beautiful housework and orgasmic sex work. Okay, so here's the thought. Making sense of the personalism of domestic service is like trying to make sense of the orgasmic prostitute. In domestic service, it's in, in domestic service as it's been represented in Parque Villa and in the films of my cycle, we have an analogous coexistence of what the anthropologist Ann Stoller has referred to as tense and tender ties. At the end of Parque Villa, the house that Beto had tended for over 20 years is sold and Beto must move out. The employer, a reserved woman, has promised to provide for Beto, her faithful servant, for the rest of his life. In one of the final scenes of the film, the woman visits the house and Beto one last time. She touches Beto's hand. The film cuts to a close-up of Beto's empty hand as he repeatedly opens and closes it, as if experiencing the feeling of the senora's touch. Moments later, the senora has a sudden heart attack and dies on the spot. Beto checks her for a pulse. Finding none, he hatches a new plan, after which he kisses the senora on the mouth, then calmly walks away, returning to her corpse a moment later with a shovel. He energetically bashes her head with the shovel six times. And this is the last clip, and then we'll wrap up.
your comments and questions. So, or, you know, the kind of complexities of this problem. So I would never claim that they have a kind of, you know, um, that, they, that they do a kind of political work in the world. I think that they help us think about the complexities, even when it's kind of, uncom you know, uncomfortable and politically, politically uncomfortable. Yeah. So they're not good as, you know, activist advocacy films. I mean, they're sort of resolutely, you know, philosophical in a way. I think, and that's what makes them, that's what makes them distinctive in the sort of, you know, uh, corpus, of, you know, the bigger corpus of films about domestic service that's, you know, span um, the century, century plus. So then, so then you're not seeing that giving the, the domestic workers personhood um, has the potential to make a, someone invested in a neoliberal economy feel better. You know, like they're not exploiting the life out of these people. <coughs> does, it, does it have any of that aspect? Because you did, or, or, it's, or it's reflecting, yeah. you, you mentioned the anxiety about the changing yeah. relations. Trying to keep personhood in there, is that serving a function in any way? I think one of the interesting, I mean, I, this didn't quite come through, but one of the interesting, I and mean, the most interesting of these films are films that basically show the fail, that are about the failure of, in a way, the, you know, interview is king, in a way of the advocacy model um, for understanding what's really going on here. I mean, so, so, I mean, they're sort of about how talk doesn't tell us anything, that this kind of work is so bad that it just, it affects everything and it creates, I mean, and it sort of produces, you know, um, gnarled human human beings, which is a very difficult, you know, which is hard to sort of um, get behind. I mean, in a way, I would say that it's sort of, that these are films strongly committed to non-commodification of human beings and about the kind of, you know, the impossibility of, of returning personhood. Because that's the kind of that's the kind of thing you know um, domestic service is. So like contrast it with something like the help or you know the um, I mean Don't many of you this. I mean the thing about the help is it's this you know melodrama you know bad masters you know good servant and there's no there's no sort of you know deep fundamental impact of servitude on the self of the I mean, it's a kind of populist, you know, that's the feel-good mm -hmm. approach, I think. I mean, this is like the feel-terrible approach. <laughs> you know, it's the feel-terrible approach with this kind of glimmer, you know, with this commitment to the truth of the possibility, the truth of this authentic colonized feeling, which seems like, you know, impossibility. And then, like, what does it mean for that? you know, colonized feeling to be true, what's at the heart of, you know, that's the kind of recuperable part. Rachel. Is the violence liberatory? I mean, at the end of those two films, when we didn't see the, yeah. the orgasm scissors, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but, but I wonder, I mean, is that the takeaway there? Is, I mean, is it liberation through violence? Does it? Release. I mean, in the, the part that you don't know about um, Parque Villa is that the final shot is of Beto in prison, 
in prison, you know, with his feet up and the television <laughs> visited by, by, you know, the sex worker Lupe. And so the idea is something like he exchanges the institution of domestic service okay. for, um, you know, this, this state. So he bashes her head in order for it to seem, I mean, that's the kind of narrative. But of course, you know, seeing him bash her head, you know, seeing him bash her head, even though narratively it's not an act of violence, she's violent, she's already dead. I mean, it's violent it's and violent. it suggests, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't think it's liberatory. And that's another way that these films are not like their European counterparts. This is not like um, the, you know, Papen sisters, you know, killing the, um, you know, killing the mistresses in, um, in the French case that, you know, has been adapted to film and, and theater several times. I guess that that's the kind of reading that I would resist, that there's any liberate, that there's any... And so in the, in the ones that aren't, aren't the best of these, um, it seemed like you were suggesting that there is a, a kind of compensatory liberal guilt. And so the endowing of, of personhood into the domestics was a way to produce that kind of ideological function. Um, and so, and um, you know, and so it seems like what you're suggesting is this is always from the standpoint of the, the master, of the, the servant. But I'm wondering if there's another possible narrative, and and, um, and this relates to something like Downton Abbey, you know, and that is that maybe one of the, one of the things that these are. One of the ideas that these are indicating for us is that um, we're being uh, asked to imagine ourselves in the role of servants. And so by endowing these um, servants with personhood, it's a way to produce an education, um, you know, rather than a sort of compensatory liberal guilt. And in that identification, then you can allow, and that allows you to imagine yourself in that position. <clears throat> and in so doing, it, um, you know, anticipates um, you know, it doesn't speak to the pre-modern, but it, it anticipates a kind of post-modern, you know, a return to feudalism, a return to a, um, a, uh, an economy that relies more and more on um, service class. It goes hand in hand with the, you know, the growth of the, of the domestic service industry, you know, the English butlers that are not going to pay $200,000 a year to do their work and so on. Um. I actually think, I mean, this is where the question of um, genre comes in. Because I think that actually, you know, these are really, I mean, these are art films that block identification. Like, in most cases, the servants are, in, are sort of impassive, inscrutable. There's no penetrating. You know, there's no, it's... In, so you I don't mean, experience their personhood? No. There's no kind, I mean, that's not the way the affect is being produced. The affect is being produced through the amplification of, you know, sound, through, um, yeah, a lot through the ampli amplification of sound, through the close-ups, through the details. I mean, the two clips you, you showed, the one of the, um, the older woman in the pictures of her hands, you know, and talking about yeah. loving her machines and so on, you know, that seemed very available to identification. And then the, the concluding clip of, of the other young woman um, and having the heart-to-heart -heart talk with her charge, uh, that also seemed very available to Catholic identification. Am I missing something with that? Um, in the case of Paulina, it's a, it's a documentary um, that's mostly made up of her, you know, talking. and. And in these interviews, she's most, I mean, the kind of, her personal story, the story of her life is what she's recounting. So, I mean, you feel you're, you know, fascinated by this story, but it's not a kind of, you don't imagine yourself, I mean, in a sense, it's the opposite. Because it's such, I mean, it's an incredibly dramatic, violent story. Um, so, I mean, if there, there's maybe something like sympathy, but not identification, and in the case of um, El Niño Pez, um, in the case of El Niño Pez, that, that character, Eileen, is also you know, a kind of inscrutable character. So notice that many of these films, like the, the, they make use of a kind of perceptual subjectivity, so the camera mimics the perception 
of the servant at times, but not their mental subjectivity. So you don't know what they're thinking. There's no content. It's about perception and perceiving. Um, so, you know, in this Nino Fest, because of this, you kind of, you know, you get a sense for it, but you're not, you can't sort of climb in her head. She's like, in path, it's sort of, she remains a kind of mystery. So I think, if anything, you know, these films are about the impossibility, the difficulty of climbing in there. You know, not like Downton Abbey, like precisely not like Downton Abbey. Okay, I was want to go back to, you started with a, something that I found was very interesting from the just historical or social point of view, which is this change in the labor market as far as how these servants now are for contract and can come for, for, if not under official contracts, there's a lot more, more mobility. Mm -hmm. They can be with you for a year, they can be with you for three years, but it's not a lifetime commitment yeah. anymore. And so when it used to be a lifetime commitment, you could ignore them fully because they were guaranteed to be around no matter what. Mm -hmm. And you know, in that typical, in that typical genre of this in, in literature as well, is that children notice them. Yeah. Because the children get some type of affection or some type of identification with, with the service, and but everybody else, they can be you know, ghosts to everybody else as long as things are clean and as long as who is served. But now that perhaps and I think this is what you said, but I just perhaps you can speak more to it, that this fascination with that they have something, that, they, that if they can come and they can go, there is something more that has to be either looked or that, or that becomes present. You know, in their transitoriness, there's a, uh, it seems to me that in that they can be transitory, there's a, a kind of a reverse effect, in which is that they simultaneously become more present because you know that you can lose them. And so perhaps this nostalgia, I mean, I'm just basing mm -hmm. on also in the, the literary text that I'm familiar with, and in, in you can lose them, therefore you, can ha you have to somehow think of them now in ways that perhaps they were not thought about before. And I'm not talking about thinking of them as people that you're going to consider their feelings and but that you have to reconsider them now that you can actually use them. Um. I guess, yeah. But I sort of think that the that the contractual is that the contractualization um, that the important thing is not presence and absence, but the but or sort of the crucial thing is not like how much time that you how much time that you spend, but um, In the past, I mean, and uh, 
Pokemon and so so perhaps I misunderstood you. I mean, so, so what you're trying to say is that in the past it mattered whether she loved me or not, and now it doesn't matter. Because now the problem is that you yeah. can lose them. If you mess up, you see, the anxiety of service today is that it's not exactly like the, the way the store has been an airplane, because there you pay your $300 for the ticket, she's supposed to smile, you're supposed to say thank you, <coughs> as long as the plane doesn't crash and she doesn't have to save your life, you can walk. <laughs> but when you have a servant in your house, and this servant is not guaranteed to be with you for a lifetime. There's an anxiety of how do I keep this person to stay an extra six months instead of leaving me now. I think the right, okay, so I think the difference is that in the <coughs> contractual relationship, it the true it doesn't matter. You don't really care if you lose them. Like that's the sign because of the contractual the relationship. Because they're replaceable. Because, because it's not just play. Yeah. yeah. Because that's the whole thing. It's not the authenticity. It's not the intimacy. So once, I mean, this problem sort of goes away. I mean, the filmmakers are sort of thinking about the old, the old, you know, this old model. I don't know. Is that when you have a nanny, you know, when you have a nanny and a nanny, you can believe it, but when you have a nanny and you know that you can lose that, you know, you finally get a nanny that doesn't, you know, where, that you get home and that he doesn't have, seems okay. And this is all an imaginary thing. You know, you get back and finally you find a nanny that seems okay. <laughs> and then the anxiety kicks in of, how do I keep this nanny here? So that, you know. But because, <laughs> the, help, but because the help changes so much, like how the attached, the nature of the attachment changes. It's like, you know, multiple baby, you know, it's like multiple babies here. So I'm kind of sad, you know, I really like that one, but, you know, I've, I've had a series of them or something. I mean, the nature of the relationship. It's like the labor market more broadly, right? I mean, people used to also stay in jobs their whole lives, so, right? I mean, so it, it's like reflects, I mean, there's something that reflects the <coughs> labor market. But I think there is something different about the intimacy of the relationship in the home, mm -hmm. and that's the problem, or that's the issue with care, or what, whatever you want to call it. So it does matter. I mean, you don't just say, "Oh, that nanny's gone. I'll get another nanny." I mean, you suffer with it in different ways, you know, and, and you want it to be different in different ways. It's a disaster so. to your own labor. <laughs> you have to spend a bunch of time looking for that new nanny and not. You know, there's some, it's, it's different, it's Anthony? Well, I maybe mean, it's a little bit of an extension, because you started by talking about the uh, relationship with uh, domestic workers, and uh, domestic workers back there, and uh, this is your uh, uh, um, as being something that's really special. So I guess I was wondering in this conversation about how that would be as the labor market shifts, as like in these other countries that it's really traditionally structural. Do you think it's that more possible? Um, that's an interesting question. I guess I'm thinking that um, 
that on that continuum of affective labor, flight attendants, service with a smile, and then sex work and surrogacy, like as the relation, as care work, as the domestics work gets more contractualized, it moves toward the service with a smile end of the um, continuum. And I'm, you know, and and to tell you the truth, I think this cycle of this particular cycle of films is not so interested in that problem. I mean, I'm sure, you know, in that that situation. They're interested in the sex work, you know, in the the extreme end of the continuum. I mean, what's going on about, you know, what's going on with thinking, with, you know, filmmaking, that's thinking about care work on the other, on the sort of other side of the spectrum is interesting. I haven't looked into it, and I'm sure there's a kind of um, you know, I'm sure there's some, you know, growing body of films. But my sense is that because these that these film make that these films are interested in that older model, the living in model at the moment of its passage, which is a kind of you know, I mean, it's a kind of big strokes in a way a kind of reflectionist theory of why this cycle now because it's striking. Seventeen films, you know, in you know, fifteen years. Seventeen, many of which are the most important films being made, you know, that have been made in the period, and they have this kind of coherence. I mean, it's always hard to care, you know, to sort of pin down seventeen films, but you know, there's a kind of striking coherence. So I, I just, which is just to say, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but that that's a different problematic. So I mean, this may be a stupid question, but I still expect an intelligent answer. Now I'm scared. Now I'm scared. No, no, no. It's, 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 no, it's just something that occurred to me while you were talking about, uh, while you were showing us the clip of uh, Jean Dillman, and then uh, Jean Dillman, the the maid who talks to her apparatuses, uh, and finally the Palkivia, right? And also what you just said uh, a little bit, a little, uh, a little uh, while ago about how um, uh, they're in, inscrutable, these, these, these characters, right? So the question was, do you make at all a distinction between personhood and personality? Because it seems like, um, it seems like personhood is more, is broader category than personality, right? We, we, still, we saw in, in Jean Dilma, I mean, she does this wonderful, skillful work, and yet her face is a mask. And, um, and, and she's inscrutable. You, yeah. you, she doesn't show anything. Everything she shows is the interaction, right? It's all about interaction, which strikes me because the maid who talks to her, to, to, the, to the machines, mm -hmm. it seems like that's her job. Her job is to interact, right? To give personhood to the things that she interacts with. And probably only a person can give personhood, right? But that, or, I mean, in the same way in which our, you know, dogs, right, give you something back through the interaction, but they're not gonna write you a letter when you're absent, right? You know, as, when you're there, you, you exist and they interact with you, right? Um, and also this, this, this scene when, when he bashes the, um, the, the, the head of a woman six times, it seems like it just continues this paradigm of interaction, right? It's a, it's a violent interaction, but it's an interaction nonetheless, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's not, and, and it's a nonverbal interaction. You know, he's not going to, um, he's not going to say, oh, you know, you left me, or, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, which the which the um, the other side the masters do say they speak right they say are you going to you know whatever they they tell a story right um, so I, I'm just wondering if there is some kind of distinction between those two personhood and personality and if what the um, what happens is that giving a personhood to something, but withdrawing the personality, or withdrawing this kind of subjective component of feeling. That's, that's what I think it is, withdrawing the subjective component of feeling. Yeah. 
No, that's and maintaining a feeling just as a structure, as a structure of interaction. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's very interesting. I mean, I guess the thing about the personhood as a con as a concept. I mean, it's mostly getting used by these legal, you know, legal and political theorists, and they're, you know, and they kind of are trying to approximate this thing. They talk about the substance, you know, the substance of the being, the self, you know, but it all remains kind of murky. But I think this, um, I think you're absolutely right. I'm sure, or, you know, this is suggested because there must clearly be a relation between insisting on a personhood that's not connected to personality. Right. So the inscrutableness, right. you know, of many, of many of these characters. Um, and also what happens with the feeling then, right? What's the nature of that feeling? Yeah, but of course the, the point is that the feeling is the kind of, you know, the mystery. Right. Right. Its authenticity is the mystery. Um, yeah, it yeah. does seem like there's a little bit of this withdrawal of the subjective component of the feeling. No, absolutely. <coughs> because that's the, that's the problem. If personhood is, if personhood is what's compromised, and it's the kind of thing that's compromised on the job and off the job. It's that kind of thing. There's no, you know, there's no help. I mean, the idea is something like, it's not like the help, where your, you know, your feelings colonized on the, or, you know, your personhood is sold on the job, and then in your leisure time you get it back. I mean, that's the condition of, you know, rented labor power. The point, the problem with selling the self is that you, you lose, you know, you lose something that belongs to you, and that, shapes your life. I mean, that's the devastation of, you know, selling personhood. That's what makes it so bad. You know, that it's not the kind of, it's not like renting out or something. Um, but I need to think more about this interaction business. But this, you know, personality, personhood, is, that's interesting. Well, that's a bit. You, you said something earlier. But I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about um, the position of these directors. You mentioned that many of them either are directly interacting with their former, when they were a child, servants, or recreating that in some way. And how much, I mean, you mentioned nostalgia, but how else, you know, do they speak about this? Um, as a, either as a group or individually? Are they asked questions about this? How do they sort of respond? And how much do you think that shapes the way activity is linked with identity? Um, is it coming from their child gaze? Is it coming from their sort of adult guilt gaze or some type of nostalgia? I'm just curious as to whether, if this is such a theme amongst these works, if they ever reflect on that yeah. outside of the production. Yeah, no, this is an excellent question. Because what ends up, in a way, happening extra diegetically outside of the story in a film like Parque Villa or another one called Bataya en el Cielo is that, in effect, the servant is performing authentic colonized feeling. I mean, inside and outside of the story, you know, inside and outside of the story world, there is the performance of, you know, authentic affect. And that's the kind of, um, right. Um, so what do they say? I mean, of course, the stuff that gets said in interviews is like the most uncomfortable stuff you ever want to hear <laughs> the, you know, life. It's awful. In the case of Batalla en el Cielo, um, the filmmaker, you know, the filmmaker in an interview with the key character talks about, of course, how much he loves Marcos, who's his driver in real life and plays a driver in the film, how much he loves Marcos. Um, and then, you know, and so there's a kind of what you would expect you know, a lot of words spent on like how wonderful Marcos is, and then the act, the key, the actress um, says something like, "He's so wonderful. He's a simple, you know, he's simple. He's not complicated like <laughs> us." Thank you. Very Sarah, much. Oh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah, I'm sorry. Right behind <laughs> you. Oh, sorry. So, um, I'm, I just am wondering where the family is in all this and any shifts in the family that are going on in the background of the shifts in domestic labor because every laborer is conceived of as an ersatz 
something else that could be a function that could be performed within the family. Um, a mother, a loving mother, a loving um, wife, a sexually engaged wife, a driver possibly replacing the father. And there's such an absence of, um, at least in the clips that you saw, showed of a reference to loving this person because my, that they take the role of the mother or um, desiring this person because um, she takes the role of the wife. And is that um, truly absent? Um, an acknowledgement of the family, and if it is, is that for a reason, or is there a politics of the family and marriage that's shifted um, as the as the um, corpus of films, the attention of the corpus of films has shifted? Um, I need to think about that more. I mean, one thing that comes to mind is this, is that in only a subset of these films, which I find really interesting, is the content of the role, like in Parque Villa and in Criada, the content of the role. So what the, the content of the <coughs> role um, is act, you know, and it's sort of importance for, you know, human life or something is taken. So in a way, you know, in Criada and in Parque Villa, um, I mean, this doesn't answer your question. I mean, yes, the 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 yeah, the families are absolutely, for the most part, absent, not fulfilling their roles. I mean, what becomes interesting is the role that um, the films that focus on the work itself, how they try to establish the significance of these, you know, of the importance of these roles in a family, you know, for care and reproduction from generation to generation and from day to day. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I need to think more about what the absence of the... Um, so the thing that has to do with the temporality, too, and the idea of being a member of the family over the long haul, and if the family is even intact over the long haul, or the family's relationship to the household, if everybody's moving constantly, splitting up, reconfiguring the family, then are the domestic servants going to outlast the marriages or outlast the relationship to the home? And that's very different than the feudal model. So um, some of those kind of changes that are probably going on in contemporary life. Yeah, I need to do that. Good. Well, thank you so much.